my interest in scepticism started with Yuri Geller. I saw him, I think it was probably on the Don Lane show, and I watched him and I thought, oh, you know, well, there'll be a, 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 an explanation for this. I didn't think it was trickery or he was a good magician. I just thought there'll be some explanation. And the very next day, it was before Google, but I made some inquiries and they said, oh, he's a, just a magician. It's a con. And I was quite angry because I thought, hold on, it was played on television as if he had scientific and paranormal powers. And it was crap. And so that's really what got me interested because I've always been skeptical. Yes, I think I read in the Bulletin magazine, which is a famous old magazine in Australia, came out, I think it was weekly, uh, that there was an organisation called Psychop. And uh, they had a magazine that ended up being called The Skeptical Inquirer. And I became a subscriber. And then one day I saw a letter and it was from a Mark Plummer in Melbourne who said that he was an Australian member and we should have an organisation going like this in Australia and were there any other subscribers who may be interested in joining him. I see, so it was that letter in the magazine that put you originally in contact with Mark Plummer. Absolutely right. I'd never heard of Mark Plummer. He was a suburban solicitor in Melbourne, but with similar sceptical views to me. It's interesting, when I was about six years of age, I came home from scripture class and I said to my mother, uh, Mum, uh, the, uh, the t scripture teacher says there's God on everyone's shoulder, but there's hundreds of people in the world, that would be impossible. And she said to me, well, look, you've just got to have faith. And I've never had faith without evidence. So that was the start of it. I then contacted Mark Plummer in Melbourne and uh, we said, in fact, I said to Mark, why don't I bring James Randi? We'd read a lot about James Randi. Why don't I bring him to Australia? And he thought that was a great idea. So we brought James Randi to Australia. He became quite famous here because of the, uh, the incident on the Don Lane show. And then uh, we set up the Australian Skeptics. So who, who came up with the name? then, Australian Skeptics, or it was just a natural thing to call it? It was a natural thing, but it was mainly Mark Plummer uh -huh. and James Durand, who, in Melbourne, who came up with the name and actually got the operation going. At the stage of Randy coming out, and it was only because we got that publicity that Mark Plummer said, look, Dick, I'll set up a branch. Do you want to become a member? I said, of course I do. And he said, in fact, we'll make you and Philip Adams the founding patrons. And so we agreed. And in fact, I think we took a couple of thousand dollars from the sale of the film to help Mark with some of the original costs. And he got James Durand and uh, they worked together and basically set the sceptical movement in Australia up there in Melbourne yeah. with all of us as members. All right. So you, that was really the Melbourne thing. You were the member, you were the patron. Yep. Did you then actively look at ways to promote it or publish it? Oh, absolutely. Look, in those days, it's a bit different to now where we've had a huge effect, the sceptical movement. You don't see the Uri Gellers and uh, the Doris Stokes anymore. And that's been some of the success we've had. But in those days, it was just run all the time and, and, and as if it was a belief and it was a fact. And... Uh, uh, what I found was I was very involved at the time because every second interview I'd do, people would be asking me about Randy and the sceptical movement. And uh, water dividing was just one part of it. I then started my own offer. And I think it was $100,000. And uh, uh, people came from New Zealand and from Western Australia to win the $100,000. And by then, James Randy had taught me a very simple protocol so it could be a very fair test. And I would test people always hoping that someone would have some of these powers, but we were never able to get any evidence that there any such powers existed in any way. Now, I'm just trying to, to narrow down this money. You had a personal prize and the skeptics had a prize. Was it, was it two separate things or was it the one? No, the prize was the one. What happened was after the original and I think it was about $50,000. We had other people coming in, Richard Carlton, uh, certainly Philip Adams, myself, and so I think, and Randy had $10,000. So I think it was either forty dollars or $50,000 for the original water dividing test. But then I transferred that over to $100,000. And it was the Dick Smith $100,000 that was in effect held by the skeptics. It was held in honour. And so they ran for about 10 years or so, the Australian Skeptics Award of $100,000 for someone who could give some evidence for one of these claims, it was to be financed by me. And then of course, more recent times that's changed.
And the amazing thing was that Randy always had a limited amount of money, but eventually I think his current offer is $1 million. And I think he managed to get an insurance company or someone wealthy to back this. So there's a million dollars there. I don't think it's going to be paid out. Randy is absolutely genuine. He would love to get someone to prove one of these claims. I would love it. It would be absolutely fantastic. But it hasn't happened yet, which is so sad. So over the next <laughs> decade or so, you weren't exactly hands-on with the skeptics, but you were, you were a patron and you're always there to be uh, on board or very interested. Exactly right, yes. I'm, I'm not a good committee person or a, a person who goes to meetings and things like that. And that's where Mark Plummer was just absolutely fantastic. He's running his suburban, he's a suburban solicitor, but he just spent probably 50% of his time at no charge into communicating the skeptical message. And he is the founder, the great father of the Australian skeptic. He's passed away now, of course, but but for Mark and James Durand, uh, the skeptics as we know it today probably wouldn't have been started. Now, when did the name Barry Williams first come to your attention? Uh, all I can remember about Barry Williams is that he's he worked, I think, for the American Trade Council, because I remember reading that or seeing him in North Sydney when I went and saw him. And for Barry to suddenly appear, what a wonderful wonderful for the Australian skeptics because once once again we had someone to take over from Mark Plummer. Mark I think he'd done what he could and he wanted to sort of move on and so he got involved in uh, rail trails turning railway lines into bike trails quite amazing and walking trails and that became his incredible job for the next 20 years quite amazing. So Barry Williams took over running the skeptics in Sydney and uh, did an incredible job as he basically looked at different fields and communicating, responsibly communicating how you should have a good sceptical view of everything. Yeah, and you were in touch with Barry for all those years, of course. All the time, yes. I, I think I probably met Barry before he took up the official appointment and uh, I'm not a great, I've never been to meetings of committees and things like that, but I've always been there just as a supporter and delighted that People have put the hard work in to keep the, keep the skeptics going and it's to their credit that they've done this and to you two here because to me it's very important that behind the scenes we just have this sceptical movement that will quickly answer once someone makes a claim. And I'll tell you what it's done. See, back in the olden days, as I talked to my grandchildren, back in the early 80s, uh, the, uh, people would make these claims and no one would answer it because we didn't have the skills to answer it. But after we brought James Randi out here, we learnt very quickly and very quickly if anyone made one of these claims or brought a Doris Stokes out to start reading the future and reading people's minds of people who had died, we exposed it so quickly that the TV stations realised we're on a, a loser here. They just stopped doing it. Yes, it was my idea to bring James Randi to Australia. I'd read quite a lot about him in the Skeptical Inquirer at the American magazine. And I thought, yeah, I'd love to bring him out here and we'll make a documentary. I'd just started making documentary films. And so the idea was to set out a challenge. And uh, actually what happened was beyond my wildest dreams when he ended up on the Don Lane show. Yeah, well, was the, the documentary, which later became called James Randi in Australia, this is the water divining test. And if memory serves, that was conducted up at Ryde? Yes. Right? In those days, I'd, I'd, I'd just started Dick Smith Electronics, was doing well, and we had a new warehouse at Ryde, and there was a block of land nearby. And uh, this was the days before emails or anything like that, but I contacted James Randi by Telex. <laughs> and then I talked to him on the phone, and uh, he said he sent me an example of a test he'd done. I think it was in Europe. And he said, Dick, if you're prepared to set up a grid of pipes and you have some land, he said, I'm very happy to come out here. He came for nothing. We just covered his airfares and he stayed with Pip and I in our house here. And the fascinating thing was that I was using an ex-ABC television producer, Bob Connolly, to make documentary films on following the explorers. Now, Bob was a bit of a skeptic, so he said, fantastic, we'll make a film. I contacted uh, Ted Thomas at Channel 7. He was the uh, managing director and he said, oh yeah, I'll buy the film from you. And so it was agreed they'd buy the film. And so we made this documentary on the water divining, which was a masterpiece in the end. We didn't realise how important it would be for the sceptical movement. 
I remember saying to Randy, Randy, look, we can't go ahead with this. We're going to destroy these people because they'd signed a document saying they'd have no excuses. And Randy said, Dick, have no fear. It will have no effect on their beliefs. And so sure enough, at the end, when it's found they all failed, they all had a reason. And so the human power to self-delude is unlimited. I learnt that at the time because I didn't want to take away people's beliefs, even if they were wrong. I mean, people have the right to be deluded. But in this particular case, it had no effect on their beliefs. But all the people watching, or most of the people watching, it had a great effect on. When we did the documentary, we also had Philip Adams lying on a desk in the Dick Smith Electronics office and Randy was performing psychic surgery on him. That was part of the film, so we just didn't cover divining. There was quite a lot and also Randy, I remember he, he had this pencil rolling up and down the, the, the desk and we couldn't work it out. We were looking underneath it and we finally worked out he was just blowing it with his mouth. But he was, he's a, was, is a master magician, without any doubt, and he had the ability to get the audience on side. And from that point on, without doubt, his trip to Australia helped him. And he was appearing on the Johnny Carson show in the United States, and he was becoming more and more famous in the US. Of course, he had a major falling out with the sceptical movement because Uri Geller took him on and, were all, and Uri Geller was also suing the whole sceptics movement and they didn't stand behind Randy. And uh, so in the end, Randy went on his own for quite a long time. Now they're all back best mates again, which is great. Another, another important story is that when we were doing the tests for the Randy documentary, uh, the, we found all of the diviners clustered around talking to each other. And so I walked over and I was listening to them and they were saying to each other, this is not going to be fair. We're all going to get this money, the $50,000. So they'd agreed to share it. They'd all decided it would be only fair to share it. They were so convinced that the $50,000 which I lay down was there. And then another interesting thing which happened, I'm not sure if it stayed in the film, it might have, that we had Australia's best diviners there. And we also had about 10 of Australia's best gold diviners. So we'd bought out, we'd borrowed an ingot of gold, which came from the mint, and we had security guards and everything. But one of the diviners dropped his little bit of gold. See, most of the diviners hold a bit of gold in their hand or a little bit of water to get the reading. So he had his bit of gold, but he dropped it. So in the end, we had Australia's best diviners all trying to find it. They never found it again. It disappeared. <laughs> a little bit of gold into the bushes or somewhere. So to me, it really taught me that water divining documentary. That was the start of realising that we all self-delude in some way and we should all try and look for some evidence before we jump in and believe something. Now, let me tell you another story when Randy was here. This is a fascinating one. He was in my office and we'd done the tests outside uh, with the diviners and that all failed. And there was a reporter interviewing Randy and the reporter was from the country and he said, mate, I believe in water divining. My dad's used it, my family's used it, it's, it's 100%. Nothing you will tell me will show me that it doesn't work. And so Randy grabbed, he said, get a couple of coat hangers. And so we bent two coat hangers so they were just in an L shape. And he said, Dick, can you go down to the warehouse and get a big speaker magnet? So he got the big speaker magnet, and of course, if you put the rods near the speaker magnet, they would pull over to the magnet. And he said, now what I'm going to do, to the reporter, to the journalist, he said, I'm going to put the speaker magnet in a box, which he did, and he sat the box on the end of the table. And he said, now, he said to the reporter, I want you to try and go past the box and the magnet, but try and keep the rods from being pulled over by the magnetic force. So the reporter goes past it and the rods bend over, you know, click against the box. He said, no, try it again. So he went the other way, boom, they go over. And then he said, oh, that's strange because there's no magnet there. And he lifted the box by slate of hand. He'd removed the magnet. And it was an absolute proof that when you think there's a magnet there, it's like walking up an escalator. You sort of tread differently. And in, in this particular case, it just showed me absolutely how if you think something's happening, the, the, the muscles in your hand will move and they'll do what you think should happen, even though there's nothing there to pull it. Another little story of, it, it, these things come back to me, of our dowsing test with James Randi. I said to one of them, I said, look, if you can find gold with 100% accuracy, uh, why aren't you wealthy? Because they all came and they had no money. And he looked at me and he touched me on the shoulder and he said, Dick, we're all not interested in money like you are. 
Yes, it was so lovely. And so they weren't interested in money, but they were all planning what they were going to do when they got the uh, forty or fifty thousand dollars or whatever it ended up to be. <laughs> yes, let me tell you the story because what had happened? We'd bought Randy out. I'd sent press releases out. The media were not interested. Basically, had no real interest in the water dividing tests at all. But then I got a phone call from uh, the producer at uh, at Channel Nine in uh, Melbourne for the Don Lane show. Now I'd appeared on the Don Lane show from time to time and I knew Don was a total believer in Uri Geller and Doris Stokes, he believed in everything. And uh, they said, oh, Don would like Randy to come on. And I thought, well, that's a bit strange, but it'll be great publicity. We had no idea, of course, that when Randy went on and the segment when Don lost his temper and threw the spoons off and walked off his own show, leaving our Mr. James Randy with national television right around the country stunned. Yeah. And of course, from that instant on, Randy was famous. I'll give you an example that when Randy arrived back in Sydney to come up to my house here uh, from uh, the next morning, I went out to, to the Sydney Kingsford Smith Airport to pick up Randy and there were all these media people there, the television and there were uh, people with their notebooks and press cameras and everything. Thought, What's this about? They were there for Randy. And so it was amazing. He went from being completely unknown to becoming famous. And if you girl Google, Don Lane Randy, you come up with that segment, it has been run and run and run and what it did for the sceptical movement was fantastic because it gave us this incredible publicity. Well, there's a fascinating story about the cheque and Pip's home account. What had happened, this New Zealand millionaire, he had this protege who could water divine beautifully and divine anything. And he contacted me and said, can I send this person to Australia to win the $100,000 by then? It was $100,000 that I came up with. And so on the morning, I had to go up to Gosford because it was a Gosford radio station that was going to run the test. And uh, I remember saying to Pip, quick, where's the checkbook? And so she found her checkbook, which was her home account, and she said, oh, it's only got $250 in it. So I wrote out the $100,000 check, went up to Gosford, and I said to the radio station manager, because he was a total believer in water dividing, you are if you live in Gosford, there's water everywhere. And I handed him the check and I said, you hand that check. You decide who's the winner and you hand the check over $100,000. And he's shaky. He says, oh, I've never held so much money in my life before. And I thought, if he only knew, <laughs> of course, I would have come up with the money. But what happened, this, this guy had arrived from uh, New Zealand. He was demonstrating. He had a brass door knocker and he kept putting it down on the ground and he'd walk around and the rods would bend. It was incredibly effective. And I said, look, we were going to have 10 uh, cardboard shoe boxes. And I said, what so we use your door knocker in the cardboard box? And he couldn't believe it. How could I be that fair? I was going to lose my money. And so we put the, uh, the, the, the door knocker in the cardboard box. First of all, we get him to check without the door knocker, is there any effect? He got no effect with the 10 cardboard boxes. Oh, one stage he saw my briefcase. He said, can I move that further away? He was convinced there was something in the briefcase because he thought, how can this Dick Smith, he's, he, he's not going to lose his $100,000. There must be something going to stop me from winning. So we moved the brief, briefcase. Then I said, now we're going to put the brass knocker in one of the boxes and you show us you get the reading. He said, oh, it's not necessary. And I said, yes, it is. It's part of the protocol set by James Randi. So we then put the brass knocker in box number two and he goes along and box number two, he's pulling the rods. It's just unbelievable, the pulling power when you know it's there. So I said, now what we'll do, and we had 10 little discs in a bag, and I said, I'll go away, and I said, you'll go away. They'll then randomly put, they'll take a disc out between one and 10, and then put the uh, brass door knocker in one of the 10 cardboard shoe boxes. Then that person will go away, and then you'll come along, and you'll divine which one it's in. Well, of course, what happened, he went, I think he magically got less than one in 10. I find this quite often happens. And so, unfortunately, he failed. Now, I must tell you another story. I'm here in the house here and uh, there's a knock on the door and this gentleman about 75 years of age had come all the way from Melbourne to win the $100,000 and he knocked on the door and he'd written to me and I said no look I don't want to spend any more time I don't want to waste your time. So he'd come over with his wife and, and he as I opened the door here he threw a dollar note down on the ground and he said look at this and he's got his divining rods out and the, the dollar note is pulling the divining rods. And I said okay so we went and got the 10 cardboard boxes and he didn't even pass the first test because oh first of all we did the test there was no reading when there was nothing in it. So then he put 
I said, now you've got to put the dollar in one of the boxes and show that it works when the lid's on the box. So he put the dollar in box number three, sat it down, then goes up and down and divines it as box number four. And his wife said, darling, remember what box you put it in. She kept repeating this. And eventually, so I said, it's definitely box number four. I said, yes, yes, pull, it's pulling like that. So we lift the lid. It's not there because it was in box number three. And what it showed is to me how genuine. I've never yet met a fraudulent person when it comes to claiming the $100,000 or Randy now has, I think, a million dollars. I've never met a fraudulent person when it comes to the divining tests. Yes, with some other other uh, contests I have, but the divining tests, they've been genuinely, genuinely believers in their ability, which they've never been able to show to any person who uses a bit of rational thinking. It simply doesn't work. It's idiomotor reaction. If you think it's there, it's there. I must tell you another story. Um, in England, there is the uh, English Dowser Society, and I became a member. They didn't know I was a skeptic. And one day they sent me their magazine and they said, we're having a contest. Here is a map and there's a gold in gold mine on one bit of the map. Please send, please douse it with your pendulum and mark it where it is and the person closest to the gold will win an award from the English Dowsing Society. I thought, fantastic. I got in touch with Randy. I said, let's watch this. And so we waited and waited and waited. We put in a couple of entrants ourselves. And then they came back and they brought out their magazine. They said, oh, we've cancelled the contest because they said something weird has happened and everything's been corrupted. And we just got random marks all across the map of where the gold was. So it had no effect on their belief that maybe their belief is wrong and you can't douse a map. I mean, have you ever heard anything so ridiculous? You get a pendulum on a map to design where a gold mine is? The Carlos Hopes, no, I wasn't involved. They were sensible. They didn't tell me anything about it. And luckily for me, I saw it I think he was at the Opera House or something, and I was thinking, when is someone going to ring me up from the meter? I'll say, this is, a, this is a scam. You know, it's a hoax. But I didn't. It was only when the whole thing was over, suddenly Richard Carton phoned me and Randy phoned me. He said, Dick, we're coming up to have a drink. And, uh, of course, they told me the story, but they said, Dick, we just couldn't tell you because we thought, you know, you're going to tell someone. <laughs> the Carlos hoax was fascinating because it showed... In those days, the gullibility of the Australian press. It, had, it was a complete setup by Richard Carton and James Randi, Richard Carton of 60 Minutes. And what they'd done is they created this person called Carlos who could channel from the outer space into crystals. And they made up some press releases before the internet, of course. So they sent out some press releases from America saying he was a famous person. He, he, he was a complete fabrication. He was a friend of James Randi who had no abilities whatsoever and had to be coached by James Randi on what to do. And they mentioned in the press release he happened to be coming to Australia. And they were going to do these uh, uh, particular shows, I think, at the Opera House. And so they managed to get, I'm pretty sure it was Mike Willisey, to completely fall for it and to do interviews and so forth. And then, of course, the whole thing was exposed by 60 Minutes, mainly with a message to the media, don't be so gullible. And, of course, ever since, I don't think any of these so-called paranormal claimants have ever had a... a, a open run on the media. They've always had a sceptical run on the media and that's why we just don't have these claimants as much as we had. By the way, I, I, I think the scepticism movement is important because from time to time, and a good example would be uh, the immunisation movement, we ended up with a situation, and I got back involved again, where there was a, 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 a quite extraordinary organisation called the Australian Vaccination Network. Now, in fact, they were anti-vaccination. They'd completely deluded themselves into believing the things you hear, that vaccination causes autism and all of these claims that have been shown to have no evidence. But they were quite influential. And so I got involved again, being sort of a public figure, and I was able to get out there and say, look, please vaccinate your children. They're going to die. And it taught me again that we have to be very careful in society because especially with modern communications, the internet and so forth, that you can send out something either a hoax, in the case of that Randy uh, Opera House stunt, or genuinely deluded people. 
And the genuinely deluded people are many ways the most dangerous to society because they can get large followings because they're so genuine. And my, my attitude on this, by the way, is that we trust doctors to do heart transplants. Well, I reckon I'm gonna trust them to tell me whether a vaccination is safe or not. The other thing we've gotta be communicating is that everything has risk. This tends to be forgotten. And yes, you, get, you go into an operation, you have a full anaesthetic, and there's a one in 50,000, some people claim one in $500,000, you will die from the anaesthetic. But that doesn't mean to say you don't get operated on for a heart problem or a lung problem, cancer, all of those things. People have got to understand that there's risk with everything, but it's the balance. What's the chance of you dying from this injection to compared to what's the chance of you having a good life because you've had the injection and you balance the two?